View from the Gutters, episode 34. Welcome to View from the Gutters, the comic book podcast where each episode we discuss a collected edition, trade paperback, or graphic novel, and then recommend and vote on the book for the next episode. Warning, the discussion portion of this show has massive spoilers for that book. On this episode, we discuss Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles, and to skip ahead to the recommendation section, skip to 3516. Alright, uh, View from the Gutters, welcome to the show, it's episode 34. Yeah. I'm Andrew Chard. I'm Joe Preddy. Eric Mannix. I'm Tobias Panchin. And I'm uh, sick Cade Reynolds, so uh. I won't be talking yeah, as much as I usually do. <laughs> Tonight, the part of Cade Reynolds will be played by sick Cade Reynolds. I made him some tea, though, so hopefully that's, that helps. That's true. That's true. Joe also needed tea for some reason. I Joe is needy. Problem. What can I say? I'm a, I am. It was a test of your friendship, and you passed. Oh, good for me. It's good. It was like Tenacious D. Just <laughs> bribed your friends with uh, tea. See, Joe's been doing a lot of friend tests. On the way here, I was like, Joe, can you not have your iPad on your knee because I'm going to knock it off your lap when I shift gears? And he's like, that was a test of your friendship to see if you'd knock it off, and you failed. It's actually, and I was like, how does that work? There's a, a friend that will remain nameless who's in town from out of town, and he has not told any of his friends here that he's here. And so I'm just feeling that I need to test the friends that are here in case they start doing that shit, because, you know, I want to be on top of that. I often am in town with you and don't talk to you. That's, but you, I'm actually you, every day of my life, if I can help true. it. That's true. But you don't move to another state That's and then true. come back and not tell me. That's fair. And I suppose. I mean, yeah. I'm giving you the benefit of the fucking doubt. Do All you right. not want it? I, I, mean, not, I don't know. I, I moved to another That's state and then friendship. came back and didn't tell you. I always know where to find you. <laughs> I, 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 not at all terrifying <laughs> I know where you live so uh, so what did we read uh, this week we read Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles Teenage Heroes in the Half Shell bum, 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 bum. I've just been power. I've had that the music from Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles 1 the movie in my head like the, the, the ninja rap time. no not that's the ninja rap that's, 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 that's in the second movie. Movie. no that's in the first one with Vanilla Ice no that's the second oh, one definitely yeah. Secret of the I swear to god it's in the first one it's the second one Jesus Christ so I remember when it came out as a kid I was like Oh my god, they got vanilla ice in this movie. And now I'm watching, I'm like, oh god, they got vanilla ice uh, in this Technotronic movie. Technotronic did the. Uh, I, I think it was Technotronic did the music for the first one. I did know, the, but it's the main awesome. Theme. The main uh, theme is great. Um, the first and I still fantastic. remember more of those lyrics than I am comfortable admitting. So Do you, you guys remember that after the second movie, the t- Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles went on tour, like as a yes, band? I do remember. Oh, that. yeah. I don't. They had a live tour where oh, they, like, played instruments and, like. <laughs> And they were wearing like rock star style. I was how you guys. remember that because you were like eight. I was not eight. How I was like you? I was born right in the prime of the. I was born in the eighty six. So oh, okay. I was right. like right in the prime of teenage. You were. Ninja you Turtles. were right in like, there. I'm. It was definitely like that's why I love this book. I think so much. Getting to the book is like they retold the origin of the turtles and retold everything. But I'm so familiar with the original origin stories right. that I'm totally fine with it because no, it's totally. like a, a new take on stuff I love from my childhood. And I, I mean, I watched every, I watched like probably half of the series of the animated shows that are out. And there've been like six, there's been, there's several there's several been a movies. lot of That's animated insane. series and I love all the movies and the cartoon that they were doing a few years ago where it was kind of a more serious style and a little bit darker. Mm-hmm. I never really watched it, but I watched episodes kind of here and there. And that was pretty good. That was the one that came out right after the movie, right? The animated yeah, uh, CG yeah. movie. Which was also yeah, good. Yeah, probably. I yeah, I really like the CG movie, actually. Like, I didn't watch it for a long time, because so I was like, ah, it looks dumb. It's the and one I where Shredder Turtles. was an alien, like, from Krang's race. Oh, I don't remember that one. I, I think that's... Oh. It was like the middle of the aughts mm. that this was coming out, or maybe early aughts. I, I, I remember the series lot. you're talking about, but I never watched it. There's some that I watched that it's, I really liked. It's the one that ended with the TV movie where they crossed over with the original Turtles cartoon from the 80s. Oh, okay. And it was yeah, really, I watched The that. one that was really silly? Yeah. Wow. That series. Mm-hmm. Yeah. That was... I don't know. They've made so many Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles shows, but I love like a lot of the aspects of the universe. Like the Dimension X war... Um, and it's something that they brought into this 
book pretty early on, and I like that with Krang kind of manipulating Baxter Stockman. I like that Krang. Uh, it was nice to be able to like open the book and immediately connect with the characters. Yeah, uh, having not read the original well, like Eastman and Laird stuff. Do we want to do what we did last week and just kind of go around the table and say what we each thought about it? Yeah, and kind of uh, say if you would recommend it or not, and and like who to perhaps. So I'm going to assume I, that you would recommend it since you recommended it. Yeah, I think I would recommend it to. Um, I think the book is fairly all ages. I think that yeah. that's pretty fair. Um, so I would probably recommend it to just about anybody, including kids that are like. They, they may not know a lot about Turtles, but also anybody that's a fan of Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles. I think of either the Eastman and Laird original stuff, the Archie comics, Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles that I read when I was a kid, or the TV shows. I think I'd recommend it to like all of those. And it's just it's a fun book. Absolutely. I the art upon reading it a second time, and like I'm reading Volume Three right now, is like I don't know. It's it doesn't really speak to me as much as like some of the previous art in other. Turtles Incarnations has. So it's like, it's a little dark, it's a little grittier, but I think the art's not, and not, it's not enough to like distract people from reading the book. Like, I think the art could be higher quality. If I had like one major complaint with the book, it would probably be the art. Um, but I don't think it'll take you out of the story enough that you won't enjoy it. So I, I'd recommend it to most people. Um, I would also, yeah, I mean, I'm probably going to go home and recommend this to my 12 year old cause I think she'll love it. Um, yeah, but yeah, I would definitely recommend it. I agree. The art was kind of a sticking point to me. It wasn't so much that I, I didn't like it. I felt like they were trying to go for a, the, the kind of feel that the original yeah. Eastman and Laird, uh, issues had, uh, that was in black and white for the most part If I'm not mistaken. Yeah, it was all in black and white. Yeah. Uh, but it was very, like, very heavy line work and, like, very, like, you know, bold. And I, I kind of like that they kept those Call character designs. 90s rough. Yeah, exa- <laughs> yeah, exactly. I think that's a very good way of putting it. Um, my problem with it was that it was inconsistent. Hmm. It felt like I, I didn't go back and look, but there was, like, I think a different artist for, like, most of the first four issues. I went back and looked, and I think it's the same artist throughout, at least as far as I read. So maybe the inker was different, or like I don't know, but I think you're definitely right about the inconsistency of the the art. There was actually one page I wanted to hold up from issue six, where April O'Neil is like hilariously off model, and like her legs are really stumpy, and but her neck's like super long, and her air, her arms are kind of like distended in this weird way. Yeah. Like, it's weird how inconsistent it is. Sometimes it's really, really good, and other times it's just terrible. Mm-hmm. Yeah, her face looks... I mean, some of the faces, even on the turtles, are, like, really contorted sometimes. And I was, I'm was, i wondering if they're going for, like, a more expressive look, kind of like Black Sad, and just, like, not pulling it off as, as well, because they just, like, seem, dis, like, in pain distorted sometimes when they're yeah. talking. Yeah. It's really odd. Yeah, I have no idea. I mean, I don't think it was, um, I tried to read Batman 100 like 18 months ago, a while ago, and I had to stop reading in the middle because I thought the art was just so bad that I had no idea what was going on, and it wasn't that bad. Not a Paul Pope fan. Not a, no, I'm not a Paul Pope fan, which kind of bums me out because I really want to finish that story, and I may go back and finish it, but, um... Like, it wasn't that bad, but the inconsistency made it a little bit harder to kind of lose yourself in it. Mm-hmm. On the plus side, it's the Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles. Like, I, I think you'd be hard-pressed not to, to find somebody that's like, no, I'm anti that, because they're awesome. Yeah. Because they're basically, <laughs> they're Ninja Turtles, all right? It, yeah, it's a they're, lot of They're fun. ninjas, which are awesome, and they're turtles, which are pretty cool. And, and they're mutants. And they're mutants, which, every, you know, it's kind of like... It's, we all like that. Yeah, and I just feel like um, uh, they do a good job of kind of, you know, the we were we were talking about this a little bit. The original Eastman and Laird stuff, they were killing motherfuckers. Yeah, like they're they're not. And I've always kind of had this problem of like, okay, so you don't want them to kill people, and yet you've given one of them two swords. It's really only one thing mm-hmm. swords are good for: right. chopping up like, robots. You yeah. could have like you could have fix that in any one of a number of ways especially in like Japanese culture there are several like things that you could have replaced those swords with that are sword like 
but not lethal in the same way. But I do. I mean, it is. But they handle it well. I mean, and there are there are you know like the whole Mousers thing and like right. There's lots of chopping robots up robots. And and I'm down. I'm guys, totally okay with that. Guys so, made of rocks and stuff that can't yeah. get chopped up by swords. So it's like cool to have the weapons. I guess. But, I I would say this. Well, um, but that's why he's a ninja. He can use his swords on like the guns or to cut like a exactly, rope to make exactly. a piano fall on people. Well, and it's yeah, it was a because a piano he's... falling on you isn't. <laughs> <laughs> it was a problem it's before, a well people. before the Ninja Turtles, because you had comic characters running around with swords, and it's like you're not going to use that. Yeah. You're not going to use that on anybody. Like, Katana's no. blew up in the nineties. I, totally I was just thinking did. about that. Like even eighties, even they were like all kinds of comic Absolutely. characters. Got I blame the weapons. Highlander. Yeah. yeah. Many people do. So uh, what did you it, think Maddox? Uh, I enjoyed the story. It was a trip. Finally reading it. Um, working at the shop. I actually get this comic recommended to me quite often. Um, and yeah, like yourselves, I grew up a big fan of you know the initial animated series. I had like a bucket of the action figures when I was a little yeah. kid, and uh, uh, in fact, my brother Sean probably still has them somewhere. And uh, yeah, watched the initial you know movies, and so I, I remembered it fondly. And in fact, the thing I liked about reading is is it didn't feel like a nostalgia trip, you know, because I feel like yeah. when I walk into Hot Topic and things like that, it's just like you have money, you were a child once, give us money to remember that childhood, you know, yeah. and this thankfully didn't have any of that it, it kind of hit all the notes i wanted to hit it, it did a good job of reintroducing these characters uh in a way that was very familiar but also brought a freshness to it that I, yeah. I really enjoyed so yeah i i actually really enjoyed it yeah uh i i didn't dislike it but i didn't really find myself liking it a lot either like i felt very neutral about it like yeah. i read it and i was like okay well that was a thing that that happened and like it just it didn't thrill me and like the arc inconsistency kind of threw me off but it wasn't so bad that i couldn't ignore it yeah i just like never really felt energized by the story and i think the one thing that bothered me was the whole thing where splinter was like talking about their previous lives and obviously like he remembered things about them and i kept thinking throughout the first arc like okay he's talking about previous incarnations of the ninja turtles and we act, we when we originally pitched the book last week, we were talking about the first volume, which is this, just the four, first four issues. And I think we all read past that. So this might be yeah. a little bit of a spoiler if you haven't read past issue four. Yeah. But he's actually talking about like them being reincarnated from humans that lived in this world a few hundred years earlier, not right. any previous incarnation of the Ninja Turtles as characters. Yeah. And that kind of threw me off a little bit. Well, they're playing with the idea, like in the original movie... Uh, Splinter learns karate from watching his master while he's in his cage, in right? One and of it's the greatest it, scenes. Yeah, as the, yeah, as the right. like stop motion rat is doing karate, yeah, which is the great. Isn't he making little sounds too? Oh yeah, he's like yeah. making little kung it's, fu sounds. It's so good, but it's like that seems like oh, that's ridiculous. Like, well, how would a rat, you know, learn kung fu and then teach it to these turtles and? I think they were kind of sidestepping that with a more like supernatural approach to the turtles and like with all the alien and science technology. And also, upon rereading it this time, and I didn't notice this the first time I read it, um, Splinter's on like weird mind altering drugs. Yeah, like I did. I, that is something I was keeping in mind throughout reading. They this. call him Splinter because the drug, and also April names all the turtles in this one, yeah. which is different than when Splinter. And it, there's a lot of cool differences, but Splinter's on. Uh, these drugs that help like fracture his personality into like an animal side and a more human thinking side. And so there's a part of me that like, yeah, I mean, I kind of wondered like, is he crazy? But then a, how would he know all that? And B like later on you find out that he's not crazy. Yeah. But how, like, did the, did the drugs affect him in a way that like allowed for him to like have this genetic genetic memory that couldn't possibly be his own genetic memory it's like some kind of spiritual memory thing yeah. um and like i i consider myself relatively versed in the turtles canon i mean i've watched a fair amount of turtle stuff mm -hmm. but i've never really considered myself like a fan mm. and i i was felt le i was left feeling flat by this and so i'm not sure if i would recommend it to somebody who was a big fan yeah. of the series although obviously you really enjoyed it yeah um 
But I'm not sure if I would recommend it to somebody who is like completely new to Turtles too, because obviously it has some consistency problems in the quality. Yeah. So I mean, I don't know. Like, I wouldn't not recommend it, mm-hmm. but I didn't love it. There's just other stuff you would probably recommend yeah. first. Yeah, that's fair. I mean, if someone's looking for a Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles comic, yeah. I mean, if me, somebody though, came up to me and was like, "I like the Turtles. Like, is there a good Turtles comic?" I'd be like, "Oh yeah, the IDW one. Like, right. Check that out." Because even though I grew up on the Archie Comics one and it has some of my favorite Turtles stories in it ever, I can't really recommend that because it starts off as such a child children's book. Like, it is very like there's almost nothing going on in those like first. I like 20 issues that's like very simple stories so it's like hard for me to recommend that where this is a lot more modern in its storytelling approach yeah what did you think Cade? um I really liked it um I I found myself um hearkening back to my childhood but in a in a not non-patronizing way um I don't know if I would recommend it right away to some people um I mean, unless I knew that that's the kind of book they were looking for. Um, definitely anybody that uh, grew up on this but has an open mind about the continuity, I would definitely yeah. recommend it to them. And I, I have to a few people over the past week. Um, yeah. Yeah, so. I think definitely, like, the having an open mind for the continuity is like a really good point because there have been multiple shows and movies and they all have a different origin for the turtles. So I think anyone that's been a turtles fan for long enough is used to kind of being like, Oh, this is a reboot essentially. Mm. So I I, think, I did like the reinterpretation of Casey Jones and yeah, April Neal. I thought I, both uh, of those characterizations yeah. work really well. I think so too. I thought I also really liked how they explained why Raph is kind of a loner. Mm. Because he's been separated from them for a long time. But one of the things I really liked about this was that I felt that... I feel like Raph is one of those characters that is always made to be like, Screw you guys! I'm going out on my own! And I definitely didn't get the feel like... Like, I, that always kind of bothers me. Because mm-hmm. I always see them as like this cohesive unit. And I think... I, I mean, it's probably because it's Kevin Eastman writing it. Mm-hmm. But... They felt like that. They felt like a cohesive unit. I think the thing I really like about this is that um, there's a lot of potential to do this in the wrong way. There's a lot Mm -hmm. of potential to do this too story heavy or um, like kind of mindless actiony, you know, and with no substance. And I think that while I agree with with Toby in in a very strange alternate universe kind of way that the reincarnation thing was kind of like i understood the need for it but i wish i feel like it was kind of a gimme like i i wish that there was something kind of more meaty there like i think and of course i say that not having like an alternate suggestion but i was kind of like oh okay we're gonna do the reincarnation thing oh whatever right like it wasn't it didn't kind of throw me enough to like make me not enjoy the story but i feel like there was a way he could have done that that maybe would have gotten the same effect and been not, a little less kind of like given on the nose. given that this was a reboot i was kind of expecting them to do something like reveal that the universe had literally been rebooted and mm-hmm. sort of like a new 52 or crisis on infinite earth sort of way and splinter actually remembers like the previous universe Oh, yeah. Or so, something like that. It's just something it's a such, little bit grander. It's such a hard concept to explain, like, why this rat knows karate and is able to teach it to his sons. Like, right. Has human right. emotion and whatever. And so, like, while the movie explained it in a way that, like, he's just emulating his master, like, this goes a little bit further and to say, like, not only why does he know karate, but, like, why is he very human like and wise? Like, how how did he become kind of that, like, wise sensei? Like right. What happened and in I, his life to make him that when he's just a rat? You I know? think and you so... could explain that by I think like the most important thing you get from that is not so much like really I'm reading this comic book. I don't really need to know why the rat knows karate. I'm no. willing to accept that. Yeah. I think the more important thing like I got from that for me mm-hmm. was his connection to the turtles. Because yeah. the question is not like 
if I'm reading a, a a comic book about four turtles that fight crime with you know because they're ninjas, right? I think I'm willing to accept that the rat, their rat sensei, like knows karate. Yeah. It's why does he care about the turtles? Yeah. And I think that like while the reincarnation thing was like it was it's, it feels convenient to me. Mm-hmm. Like I want. I think you could have put that off for a little bit and kind of come up with something like, you know, maybe there was something in like, you know, you, you do the super soldier thing or, or something else. Or maybe you explore that story in like greater depth and it becomes you actually are able to connect with him in his first life. And you make that right. like its own arc later on. And that way it doesn't feel like, oh, we need to explain this here. Reincarnation. Right. Like it's more like, whoa, that was really... Yeah. Given that they were all in, like, a secret laboratory where they were doing military experiments mm. with, like, super soldier drugs and stuff, you could certainly have explained it like, you know, they've been genetically altered. They were able to pick up all of this information before they were mutated into right. humanoid forms, like Splinter was exposed to training videos or actually, like, watching Gamma super... Or yeah, whatever. or something... <laughs> You could totally explain it like yeah. this is why they're able to learn ninja skills so quickly right. and, and they, all that stuff yeah. without adding in the additional layer of reincarnation. I like. I really like the reincarnation. I think that, that you're right. There probably could have been a better way to do it. But for what it is, like making the turtles actually related to him in a past life, like making them actually family, like increasing that family tie, I think was something that was really cool. I like that. Yeah, and I well, like it's, it's it's developed more. I think I read that slightly farther than you guys. I actually because at first I was I was like that's a little hokey. I don't know if I. But mm-hmm. then like they they keep revealing things about it, and to me that made me appreciate it even more. Well, and, and that's kind of what I think I want. Keep it back. Yes. And honestly, because at first I had the same reaction. I was like reincarnation. What? Like is that what they're trying to tell me? And then, but honestly, yeah. As I you know, I read a few more issues in. Um, yeah, it it is a deeper. Th- well, and then I started to think like. Isn't it weird that like a rat is calling these turtles son and they're just right. going with it? Right. And before you know that, like, I mean, it, you always just accepted it, so it's not like it, it couldn't just be a thing. I mean, right. you have friends that you call brother and whatever. I mean, that's. Right. But you know, it's like okay, it does. To me, it made for this this deeper connection, uh, which you didn't necessarily have to have. But I like, you know, again, having read a slightly farther direction that they're going with it. The thing that sold it for me was that even the turtles were were doubtful of uh, the whole reincarnation thing. Yeah, especially Donatello, Donatello. which makes him such an interesting character because yeah. he's a man of science, and he's yeah. like, now nah, I'll find a different way to explain this. And that's like, there leads a little bit of doubt in there. But uh, reading further brings me into like two points I wanted to make about the book is, one, having the reincarnation thing allows you to create a deeper connection with one of the series' main villains because I'm pretty sure that's the whole, like deal with shredder was in the original movie it was like shredder had killed splinter's master yeah but in this one it's like splinter or shredder had actually killed him killed and his sons and And his his sons right so it just like deepens the connection with that villain and because you don't really see shredder until volume three of the trade like as shredder proper um it just I'm really appreciative for the fact that they took their time in introducing the villains because there are so many iconic Turtles villains like Shredder, Krang, Baxter Stockman, Slash, Bebop, and Rocksteady. And like a lot of them. I was really sad I didn't get to see Bebop and Rocksteady. They come in later. Yeah, they're there. Like, that's the cool thing is like you're just waiting for your favorite villains to show up kind of in a cool way that they're like introducing the Rogues Gallery over a series of time and not just like they're all there right away and try to cram too much in and I think right. that's, like Joe makes a good point that it was done really well like the series could have been done a lot worse it could have mm-hmm. just had all of those guys there right away and the slow reveal of Krang like the name comes up before you see him and you're like oh I know who that is because I've read Turtles before but if you hadn't it would be like a really cool reveal and I just think they did a lot of smart things with yeah, the series yeah I agree completely and it's, uh... it's not my favorite thing that I'm reading right now but I am getting enjoyment out of reading the new stuff, yeah. and it definitely makes well, me want to go back and like watch old Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles well, stuff. I, like, I'll probably watch the first movie tonight. I, mean, I think it's awesome because more than like, I mean, I I will be the first to admit that my problems with it aren't really problems; they're nitpicky things, right? It's mm-hmm. like I I think I think it was really I enjoyed it, and well, I think more than enjoying it, I think this is a title that 
young people can get into and that's what the industry desperately needs is like new yeah, blood I think so and too. so this is a book you could recommend to somebody who's 10 11 12 because there's not a lot of gore there's not a lot of, you know it's a well, solid they're not, they're book heroes. that tells a they're good story being heroes they're not yeah exactly they're either. heroic and it's not patronizing or patronizing and it's not like pedantic it's mm-hmm. fun yeah you know and at the end of the day it's like I'm going to sit here and say, well, maybe they could have done the reincarnation thing better, but if that's something they're developing down the road, then that's, you know, that's really what I'm looking for is the connection for the, to those characters. Right. And I think they nail it. I think they get the family dynamic of the turtles really well without it being sappy or like sentimental. And they feel like a unit to me. And that's what I really like. And I really did like the, the rebooted Casey Jones and April mm-hmm. O'Neil. And I love that Casey Jones is in there because he's a badass. Yeah. He's one of my favorite characters. Yeah, absolutely. And I, I just love the like him and Raph connection. Like they've always been closer. Yeah, yeah. You know? And I just I loved it in the movies and I loved it in the book. I thought it was cool. But I think that your nitpick, as you said it, but your critique of the book is valid though. I do think that like with better art, it could yeah, have drawn that's you the into kind the of story. Well, like, I, like I kind I like the art style. Yeah. I just wish it was more consistent. Yeah. As you've been talking, I've been flipping through, and there's a page in like. I want to say issue seven where April is training with Casey Jones mm-hmm. and the art on that page is like, it's fine. Yeah, they it's all look, really they both look great. And I don't understand why the artist can't make every page as good as this one. Yeah. And like, I, why does it fluctuate so much? Yeah. And maybe the speed of the book or just the budget being. An yeah, IDW, I I just, know, yeah. I don't know. It, I don't know what it is, but if they could hit that level consistently, I think I would have liked it more than I did. And sometimes it just, just like is so jarring. It just takes you out of the story. And I think that is unfortunate because I think the story is really interesting. And, yeah. And but, like, I don't, I don't disagree with any of you guys. Like I I didn't dislike it. Like it's yeah. it's a perfectly good comic. It just didn't. I didn't feel energized by it. Like yeah. I don't feel like I want to keep reading this personally. Yeah. And yeah. you should totally recommend it to like you know Joe's daughter. And I think that she'll probably enjoy it. Yeah, I it think, just wasn't for me. Yeah, I think that it sometimes misses on the like the story connection beats when it could have really. I also kind of wonder what the perspective of somebody would be who has not read anything of the Ninja Turtles. And so all of this stuff is brand new to them, all of these concepts. And they're not going, oh, General Krang, I know who that is. What? You, has your daughter, does your daughter know much about Ninja Turtles? No. She knows not nothing? So you're so, going to recommend it? So we'll find out. It's going to be my test <laughs> bag. Uh, a note on the art, too. Um, I'm not caught up, but Sam is. And mm-hmm. Sam says the current artist on the book, because I think like 25 just came out, issue 25. He said the current artist is the best artist by far they've had so far. Oh, cool. I don't know who that is, but it sounds like there has been an improvement on the art in that currently. Awesome. It's a, so I'm actually looking forward to getting to that point. Because, yeah, I have been enjoying it, but, yeah, it's definitely – because it's, it's, he's been doing the layouts most of the time. But yeah. I don't know if it's different people finishing it, inking it. I mean, because, yeah, it is – um, Very inconsistent. From what I could tell, most of Eastman's involvement was just the uh, story plotting. Co-plotting on some of them. I know initially he was doing some some of the, the, the rough pencils, okay. but uh, mm. there's definitely some issues where he's just co-plotting. All of the issues that I read, the artist, it just, the credit is art, Dan Duncan, Dan, and then okay. a separate colorist. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And I think... And that might change after issue 10, because that's the point that I read up to. Mm-hmm. But I believe he's the artist on all of the first ten issues. Yeah, mm-hmm. I think the art changes later. Um, um, but... I did notice that the free comic book day Ninja Turtles one that they released this year has a much different art that uh, looks identical to the original animated series. And that's yeah, that's for the new book that I think I think they're only on, they're only on like issue two, I think right now, maybe issue three. Like they they just launched a children's title basically i don't know if there's a current animated series like a new animated series but it's certainly I think that style probably probably no, like the timing always, of the book I'm if guessing. there isn't one right now there's probably something in the works yeah because marvel did the same thing there's like a, some hulk agents of smash or something yeah. kitty book and I'm like, i don't remember there being a cartoon but i think it's forthcoming so yeah I think, well thing. it's out because i've been reading about it on comics alliance or one of those sites it actually looks pretty interesting Hmm. I just am kind of like Hulk Agents of Smash I'm like I'll, I'll read that I'll give that I'll yeah, give that a shot anytime Hulk is punching stuff, Agents of Smash interested. yeah it's like I'm, I'm kind of like okay yeah you want to make Hulk he, smash things I'm with you I'm totally on board that I time. hope he just teams up with like all of the 
like really powerful heroes from the Marvel Universe. He's just got <laughs> like the thing. the thing and Ares and Thor and just like a whole bunch of guys that hit stuff really hard, really good. Yeah. And that's Dude, like the whole team. Hercules. Hercules, yeah, I can't forget Herc. Hercules. Is awesome. Yeah, right? And Beta Ray Bill. And Beta Ray, oh, Beta go, Ray yeah, Bill's in go. it, I'm sold. Uh, I'm pretty much yeah. I mean, you could pretty much put Beta Ray Bill in anything, and I'd read it. We're like, oh, it's a power pack. I don't want to read that. Beta Ray Bill's in it. Give it to me now. <laughs> I have like, a confession: the power pack is like my guilty pleasure. No, it's like it's the book, like, I don't admit that I like it to people, except I just did. But like, dude, I, I love power pack. I have a ton of, a big fan. I have a ton that was of one of the pack first pack. things that I actually read, and I've actually I was thinking about recommending Power Pack Classic Volume One, Ooh, yeah. and then I went back and read it, and I was like. This is still really good for a kid, but I don't know that it's necessarily something that I want to talk about on the podcast. And it does get better the later it goes. And so, you know, if you have a kid, I would still totally recommend the classic power pack to them. It's just not something that I think it necessarily still works as an adult. It's weird, too, because, like, in the 80s, like, any time they did a crossover... Uh, the power pack was involved. That's usually the way people even know. Like, who the heck? Yeah, that's I mean, how power I, pack kids. That's cause... how I got to reading Thor because there was a crossover with Thor, like right around the time he got turned into a frog. And it's like, oh, yeah, power pack's crossing anyway, over with Thor. We got to get this. I, yeah. Oh, yeah. oh, all right. Should we? Uh, anybody they, have anything else? They want oh, to say I, I got one more quick thing about power pack. All right. During the in, the massacre in the Morlock tunnels, the power pack, like these eight and ten year old kids. We're down in the tunnels, like, as people are being massacred around them. It was crazy. Wow. Damn you, Gambit. Was that Gambit? That's a retcon. That's a retcon. That's a bullshit retcon. <laughs> <laughs> That's fucking bullshit. The smirching it Gambit's... It well, originally it was just, uh, it just the marauders it's... under under the leadership of uh, Mr. Mr. Sinister. Oh, well, okay, right, right, Sinister. right. right. Uh, they, um, that was after right. Mikhail Rasputin went down there, right? Or was it before? Is uh, mm. Peter uh, Colossus's brother was living down there? We was shacked was up with what's her face. Well, didn't didn't he end up teleporting most of the Morlocks to another dimension, and that's where God, people like Mar- Marrow dude. come from? I can't even remember because I'm pretty sure that that was uh, after the Morlock massacre because it might have Marrow been. was a little girl during the massacre, Marrow, uh, and then Marrow was also definitely right. They went to another dimension nice. where time yeah. passed quicker, and so she came back as a late teenager mm. in the night. It was the nineties. Uh, okay, yeah. it was around Uncanny three fifty when they did. Let's the whole, uh, let's comment. let's drop this line of conversation. Yeah, I have no idea. This is, like, this is the conversation Sorry. for the ride home. This is going down a bad yeah. road. So right. let's. I, do, uh, I have one more power pack. Note. Okay, uh, yeah, go. Several years ago, they uh, came out with a. I mean, it was always a kids book, I guess, but it used to be an in continuity kids book. That's why you had the team ups. They uh, several years back they started doing these little a series of mini series uh, for the power packs. It'd be like power pack. And the X-Men power pack and, and the Hulk. And they're each like little four-part super cutesy kid book. They were pretty solid for what they were. I bought every single one. And, uh, the, yeah, the girl at the danger room one day was like, oh, it's so great. Your kids must love this. And I didn't have any children yet. <laughs> you were like, no, <laughs> like, no, they totally yes, do. They totally do. I bought do. this for my child. <laughs> I'm not a grown man reading this. That's what you got me. It's for my kids. Hey, you know, yeah. for a while, I just, in defense of that, I will say that for a while there, Archie was the only publisher doing anything even remotely interesting with their yeah. characters. They had the first gay marriage. They were doing this whole, like, rebooted Archie universe thing. Like, they were actually, I would read about what they were doing. I'm like, when did, Arch- when did they do the first? When, when I was definitely marriage? before. Because the Authority Star. had one, right? Okay, like, right. They, I think technically Authority is the uh, asterisk on well, that. Well, yeah, no, because but, it was, uh, okay, My okay, I, have a, I have a response to this. It was not <laughs> technically a gay marriage. It was a, it was a, 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 a civil union. Uh, but yes, right. Batman All and right. Superman tie the knot. I mean, yeah. Yeah. Apollo well, and the Midnighter. Yeah, the, uh, the Wildstorm Batman and yeah. Superman, yes. Yeah. Um, Which, uh, yeah, like, I do not acknowledge Stormwatch in the new 52. It's ridiculous. It's a no, ridiculous idea. I don't acknowledge the 52. <laughs> no, 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 no. <laughs> <laughs> oh, man. Okay, this Hashtag is a half that we yeah. have. Yeah, yeah, let's not go I, I, I definitely down. tried to read a new 52 book this week because I had heard an interview with the writer of the the now going on series, and I was like, oh, well, I'll catch up to get up to that writer, and it'll be fun. 
Oh man, it was like pulling teeth. What book I'm was serious. JLA Dark. Oh god, I'm so sorry. I'm having a hard time. Is Milligan still well, writing it? He's now the writer on what? it, but he was not of the book that it I was, read. Was it Jeff? I don't know if Jeff Lemire. No, no, no. Oh, oh sorry, Milligan started it. Milligan started it. Yeah, Jeff Lemire's doing it now. And now, it's and now it's I don't Jeff know what the hell Usually happened Jeff to Jeff Lemire's awesome. So I don't know what the hell happened to Peter Milligan because he wrote. A, he's a great fucking comic book writer. Oh yeah. And Statics is amazing. Yeah. Uh, which is the series that X Force became that he did with Mike Allred. His X Force no kind of stuff writer really can it, overcome it. the overwhelming force of I'm how saying, shitty I'm, the new Fifty Two. I've gone on was, record and yeah. saying that even Snyder's uh, bored me off of Batman. Uh, the first, the first major arc of Batman is good. The first major arc of Demon Knights is good, and the first major arc of Birds of Prey is really good. All three of those are really good, but after that, DC just kind of reached out with its icy death grip and grasp them all to its bosom and just sucked out any kind of creativity or goodness that was left and turned them all into 90s image books. All right. Well, right. I, I think wow. that this is territory that we've gone over yeah. way too many times already. But never in this context. <laughs> um, <laughs> it's a good segue, though, into, into, recommendations into recommendations because yes. Joe brought a DC book that doesn't suck. I did, I did, and I was actually going to recommend something else for my kid, but I'm, I think I'm up against some pretty stiff competition here this week, so... Well, I, I can might... recommend my DC book, if you don't... If yeah, you well, still... Chard, why don't you recommend your oh, DC, right. book, DC book, and um, Joe can save his DC book for next week. Yeah, we, I've talked, uh, we've talked on the podcast a lot about the writer, artist, uh, cartoonist, Darwin Cook, and yes. I, I, I'm a huge fan of Darwin Cook, and uh, Joe's recommended The Hunter, and I was like, oh, I'll recommend a Parker book, you know, like... You can easily pick up the outfit or the the uh, what's the third one? Uh, the, the the score. The score and like not have really read the first two and that's fine. And then I was like, no, he's done some other really great stuff. And I was kind of mulling through my head of what he's done. And the book that I'm going to bring this week is uh, DC's New Frontier, Ooh. Uh, which is a book that I absolutely love. Yeah. And uh, Darwin Cook's art on it is phenomenal. For those who don't know, it's uh, a retelling of the JLA's origin stories, essentially set in the era that they were in. Set in real time. In real time. So in the early 50s. Um, but unlike the DC universe, like originally, it's able to touch on some of the like communist scare and the McCarthyism and some of the like real world issues that were going on at the time that the DC editorial like didn't really want to touch because it was kind of, you know, over the top of kids' heads. And so this is a very great retelling of, you know, U.S. historical events, but also superhero events at mm. the same time. Yeah. And the art is phenomenal. I love Darwin Cook's Darwin art. Cook if you, is one of the best. Yeah, Artists. if you're into anything, like, you can stand a more cartoony style, which I think everyone should, and learn to appreciate, like, what that, the simplicity of that, what that does for the art. Um, the colors on that book are phenomenal. And uh, the Absolute Edition is fantastic if you can get a want to get a giant hardcover of his beautiful art you definitely can but yeah new frontier uh I, dc it's i awesome. actually have not read it but i did see the animated oh, yes. movie of it and that was pretty good yeah, yeah. the animated movie that's was the really best good. adaptation that they've done because darwin cook was actually involved in that they yeah. basically just trimmed a bunch of stuff but it still had this, the meat yeah and right darwin on. cook was the he's the one that took over for bruce tim is dc's like animation yeah. editor so like he did the last season of batman the animated series and then he like mm. oversaw superman and then the transition into justice league and justice league unlimited right, so like right. i mean he was part of that team he wasn't the only one there but um Darwin Cook's you done mean, a lot. He of... didn't do all the writing and animation and voices by himself. Well, he could have. He actually he did, but he keeps it on the down. <laughs> yeah, he could have because the guy's a machine. Like that guy yeah. can put out books like nobody's business. But um, no, he uh, he worked with a great team over the DC animation. But uh, a lot of that, I definitely think, was Darwin Cook's sensibilities leaning in there. So he's done some great stuff for DC, and this is probably my favorite thing I think he's done. Great. So, what are you recommending, Joe? Um. Well, I I promised my kiddo that I would recommend Hopeless Savages, uh, which is basically like um, a series of stories about uh, a, like the punk rock Partridge family. It's Jam and Meter, right? Yeah. yeah. So, well, she's done part of it, but it's actually there's writing from a bunch of different people okay. in it. Uh, and uh, from what I've read of it, I haven't read the whole thing. I've just read a little bit, but it's a lot of fun. It's a young adult's title. Um, but... Uh, 
Uh, it takes. It's. I think it's about their daughter, whose name escapes me right now. But I, uh, the art's great. Uh, it's a lot of fun. I mean, it's pretty much. I, if I didn't get you with punk rock partridge family, I don't. I don't know what else I can say to sell it because I mean, come on. Like that's that's just it's pretty great. That's pretty great right there. <clears throat> All right, Eric. Uh, well, it's funny because we actually talked about this without realizing we were talking about it. The book I brought was X Men Mutant Massacre. Uh, I'm just going to keep bringing X Men book till we pick one. Uh, <laughs> I picked I picked this book because it is the first X Men crossover ever, way back in 1987. I thought it'd be a nice segue because it actually has. Simonson Thor when he's a frog in this area. It has power pack in this book because this is the story. Uh, and it also has Daredevil. I think it was Anosenti at that point, which that is a criminally underrated run because everyone's like, Frank Miller. Anosenti came on like a handful of years later uh, on the title. This was like the late 80s. And uh, like John Romita Jr. did a lot of the art on it. Plus Daredevil. That's what, what Daredevil's in this. So, anyways, so read the Anosenti Daredevil run as well. Um, But yeah, this has just the wholesale slaughter of a group called the Morlocks who are uh, mutants that are, they don't pass for human people like Cyclops. You put some ruby visors on them, they they, they look just fine. Even like Angel could kind of put a harness on. And all the X-Men are pretty enough or whatever that they can pass for a human. uh, Beast originally was. Beast originally, he had like really big feet. But but by this time, he had been an, an Avenger. And basically, like, once you're an Avenger, the fact that you're also a mutant does not Doesn't matter right. anymore, apparently. Because everyone just loves the Avengers and the FF. Yeah, that's, right. like, one of the, the, the X-Men tropes is, like, you have the same powers, but you've got them differently, so people love you. Yeah. That's great. But, uh, uh, yeah, so this book, and, and I'm not thinking any retcons are awful things that came later because I hate all the things they tried to add to it. But this book itself... Is just super brilliant. Uh, it was a really weird period in the X Men's history. Uh, Storm was depowered, if I remember correctly. So she was just a yeah. This human was the, the origin of Mohawk. The Mohawk she was, Storm. She was depowered, oh. but she had the power of a Mohawk. She had the power of the, of the Mohawk. And uh, I believe this is the period that the original X Men were X Factor. They were X Factor, nope. yes. And Magneto was running the New Mutant School, so Magneto was actually a good guy at this point. Yeah, and the X Men were what X Factor was them pretending to be mutant hunting Hunters, humans, and they would actually uh, help. The, mutants, yes. Right. Then they were working for the government. I'm flipping through it right now on the first page. I turn to as Thor with a beard and then Volstag on the next page. Dude, Thor it's... it's and yeah, you it's, got insanely happy. Right? Yeah, I did. I was it's, like, it's, ah! it's Chris Claremont X-Men. It's Walter Simonson Thor. It's Anno Sensi Daredevil. And it's fucking Power Pack. And what more do you need? Hey, Louis Simonson. Louis though. Simonson, yeah. yeah. Who's the guy on the horse? Is that Pester? Is that the Black Knight? That's no, that's uh, what's his face? Oh, that's, it's, uh, oh, that's Balder. Oh, yeah, okay, Balder he just Brave. looks different. Than I... Yeah, I thought he it was wh- Balder. I totally second guessed myself. He had I white hair for I some don't reason. I remember that. It's because he was awesome. All right, All right. they've really changed the look of Balder. In well, let's actually uh, the ballad of beta, right. the Beta Ray Bill story we talked about last week actually leads into well, one of the things Walter Simonson deals with is Balder's totally lost his awesome. Yeah, and, and he actually had his own title for a while. Back. Yeah, he has to go and get his groove back. Yeah, I saw that movie. He, uh, yeah, I guess he did have his own title at that point. But uh, so, uh, so should I do mine? Yeah. No. So uh, last week or last weekend at uh, the local comic book shop, there was a really great sale. It was basically a forty percent coupon off of most of the stuff in the store, uh, and I managed to pick up something that's a story that I really love. That's been going online as a webcomic for a long time, and I managed to pick up this really great oversized hardcover. And the comic is Earthworld, book one, The Battle for Goblin Knob. <laughs> and Joe is laughing. Um, so basically, the gist of the story is that there is this other world called Earthworld, where the world is explicitly like a turn based strategy game. The world is broken up to, into hexes. Days consist of turns. Everybody has stats. No children are born. People just pop into existence in the city for the side of which they are a part. And in this story, there's a guy named Stanley, alternately called Stanley the Worm or Stanley the Tool, who uh, has basically had a coalition spring up to kick the shit out of him because he's such an asshole. And his side has been reduced down to one remaining city, which is the most defensible city in all of Earthworld called Goblin Knob. And Stanley has his chief caster, 
uh, cast a spell to summon the perfect warlord. And so what it does is it summons this guy named Parson Gotti from Earth, which in this story is called Stupid World, <laughs> who is like, he's a strategy gamer. Like he's a hardcore role player. Like he thinks about strategy games all the time. And he's done games very much like Earth World hundreds, thousands of times. And he gets summoned into this dimension and has to figure out how to win an unwinnable battle under very, very difficult circumstances. And it's kind of funny because everything in Earth World is kind of a joke or a pun on something in our world. Like the chief warlord for the Goblin Knob side before Parson gets summoned is Sir Manpower the Temporary. <laughs> Um, but the story itself is obviously really serious because they're looking at getting killed and Parson is trying to figure out the rules of this world as he goes along. And like, this is a very difficult thing for him to do. And so it's a really funny, really interesting story. The art is really cool. The particular Super edition cool. that I have is really nice because it's got these giant pages. Um, this is a webcomic. Originally. It's a webcomic. Originally book two is almost finished. It's in like the epilogue right, right. now. But you can go back and read everything up to date for free. Sweet. Uh, and it's one of my favorite webcomics. It's just a really fun story. And I think everybody should check it out. Awesome. Yeah, I was thumbing through it as Toby was talking about it. And the art looks great. And it just looks like super fun. I, like, there's like chat logs going on. And yeah, some they have this. these things called iBooks. <laughs> E-Y-E. But they work like AOL Instant Messenger. <laughs> and they like make those sound effects like quacking and popping when they go. It's... It's really cool. Yeah, it looks clever and fun. All right, Cade, what do you got? Okay, well, I want to start my uh, recommendation off with a preface. Um, if you're going to vote for an X-Men book at the table, don't vote for this one. <laughs> <laughs> Since there's a much better one sitting across from me. Um, I was reading X-Men vignettes that Eric Mannix brought last week, and I had forgotten how much I liked uh, Chris Claremont's X-Men. And so the book I brought is uh, his run, or the beginning of his run on Extreme X-Men uh, back in 2002. Um, it was very overshadowed by a much better book at the time, Grant Morrison's New X-Men. Mm -hmm. And uh, this this is not a great book, but it is a fun book. It, it yeah. has some very great scenes in it that just it makes you smile like that kicks ass kind of thing. But it's, I mean, it's a new team. It's uh, Storm, Rogue, Psylocke, Beast, Bishop, and then um, the new Thunderbird and Sage. Um, and, I mean, oh, and it's, uh, the artist is Salvador La Roca, who is pretty phenomenal. He uh, did Matt Fraction's run on Invincible Iron Man, which I absolutely loved. Um and uh, there's something else he did recently, but now I can't remember it that I also loved. Um, but yeah, I just I wanted to get it out there and yeah, I have some really weird fond memories of this book because I was reading everything X Men that was coming out at the time because I was in high school at this in this time. So I remember reading the first like issue or two of this. Isn't this the one where Rogue has Wolverine claws? Uh, or I, something like she has a really different power that she normally doesn't have. I don't remember that. Can, can I see the trade? Okay. I don't remember that. I, the the whole basic premise is they have to find uh, Destiny's diaries. Destiny being uh, one of the former uh, Brotherhood of Mutants uh, members, the former lover of Mystique. Although they weren't allowed to really fully flesh that out back in the eighties, but that was always the intended relationship right, with her right. and Mystique. So they played it off more like they were like sisters or something. But, uh, and at this point she was uh, deceased. I can't remember how she bought the farm, but she, uh, uh, Legion kills her. Doesn't he? When he breaks out of, uh, Moira McTaggart's lab, she totally has Wolverine claws at I, least in this like one page that I flipped to. Uh, I forgot about that. She does. Yeah, I don't remember what what's Are up with that. Are they bone claws? They better be bone claws. Cause uh, they look like generate... bone claws. All right, then that's not nearly as annoying. As you can somehow grow adamantium, and then we're going to... I think yeah. well, <laughs> the, other that's thing, a problem. the other thing is, like, this was uh, after Wolverine Origin, 
I think right now it's it was around no, the same time. I think it was a little bit before. It was before, a little bit before, but it was after they had revealed that he had bone claws rather yes, than yes. which was um, that was uh, a uh, fatal attractions in the uh, mid nineties when they but uh, after that revealed that and then three D holographic covers. I have all of them. If uh, then a- after that time, any time that Rogue would touch Wolverine, she would get like his full power set, including the bone claws. The bone claws. Right? Yeah, so that's, yeah, I remember that now. But yeah, this was uh, coming out. Was it was definitely overshadowed by um, New X Men. But I was also reading Uncanny X Men at this time, which is probably the lowest it's point. The in Chuck a, Austin. It's Chuck Austin. Uh, probably the worst run of Uncanny or well, X Men period I've ever read. Yeah, and it, that was my favorite. Like when I was, <laughs> I was loving the shit out of it, and I realized that it was terrible. But I liked the team that was on. Well, in like, Beak, they did a lot with the character Beak in that Uncanny Run. Uh, no, that was New X Men. Well, yeah, they, they'd be they'd Beak and, and Juggernaut be, being friends. Oh yeah, that's right. That later yeah, later yeah. when Juggernaut joined the team, I, I was thinking there's a of ton of stuff with Juggernaut. And... But the early t- the original team was like so all Chuck mutants Austin. that I loved. It was like Iceman, Nightcrawler, Wolverine, yeah. and uh, Angel. And Chamber, and then it, and then they had Stacy X on the team, who was like it's a like new a, mutant they created. Like it was, a mutant prostitute. Yeah, she was a mutant prostitute because she would like yeah. use her pheromone powers to like make people feel like crazy good. So if yeah. you were like a high class businessman, you could afford to hire her as like a high class prostitute who would just mutant sex you. <laughs> so. <laughs> I don't know. And she joined the X-Men for some reason. I'm not sure why. Because what else are you going to do? I don't know. But... I guess Dazzler wasn't around. Yeah. <laughs> but I, I really like that team because I've always loved Nightcrawler and, and Iceman and Wolverine. So, But that run was awful. But X, Extreme X-Men is actually a lot better than that Chuck Austin yeah, run, so you should read it's that. It's definitely underrated, for sure. Yeah. Yeah, more people should check it out. And unfortunately, most of the trades are out of print, so it's yeah. harder to find. But it's 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 They should do a big a omnibus of that. They should. So, uh, can I do something a little unorthodox? No. I'm, I'm going to do it anyways. Okay. You can't stop me. I didn't, I, I really don't, because I have not finished reading Hopeless Savages. I don't think I gave it a good pitch, so I'm going to pitch what I brought, and okay. I'm going to bring Hopeless Savages next time and give it a All good right. pitch. All right. What I brought was uh, volume one of Giffen, Keith Giffen, and um, I can never, J.M. DeMatteis' run on Justice League International. This is uh, in the late '80s, I think. This is coming yeah, this out. Is, this is the post uh, this Crisis is, on Infinite this is, yeah, this Justice is, League. This is 1987. It's post. Yeah, it's post Crisis. Post Justice League Detroit. Yeah, and <laughs> it is. Uh, <laughs> DC's even thought that. Basically, way. if you've ever looked at, if you're not familiar with this part or era in comics, and you've ever looked at Blue Beetle and Booster Gold and gone, "Where the fuck did these guys come from?" This is where they came from. This is what established them. Uh, I mean, Blue Beetle was around before, but this is Ted Cord as Blue Beetle, and uh, yeah, this is when like the classic characters like Superman. And yeah, all that they were left. all They're fucked off. It's like and Captain doing other Marvel, things. Guy Gardner, like, Fire and Ice. Yeah, they couldn't get Dr. Hal Jordan, Mr. They, Miracle. Like, like, yeah, like this is your like. It's like you're not ready for prime time players of the DC universe, right? <laughs> And it is oh, awesome. I forgot. No, Big Bart is in this too. Big, but, well, uh, not in the first not trade, in, not yeah, until okay. later. But Mr. Miracle, I always forget what his alter, he's an escape artist. Yeah, and exactly. I always forget what his and alter Scott ego is. Free. And then Scott, it's, it's Scott, Scott Free, Free, and it makes and me laugh Oberon, every yeah. time I remember. Yeah, right. <laughs> Oberon is his manager. Uh, this is the Justice League played for laughs. It's a it's a huge amount of fun. Uh, it is. I think probably one of the best runs and on I, Justice League ever. I it, mean, you yeah. can definitely say that like Grant Morrison's run was good, but he was doing an entirely different thing. Yeah, this is basically the whole first trade is like Batman telling Guy Gardner to shut up, or he's going to clock him. You know, Blue Beetle pretty much being like, "I'm Blue Beetle," and uh, everybody else trying to kind of get a grip um, on what's going on. And Martian yeah. Manhunter spends a lot of time face palming. Yeah, and Martian Manhunter, Black Canary, and um, Batman are probably like the most recognizable. Yeah, characters, characters absolutely. And that I, stay that were like at that time. But then there's also Doctor Fate and Guy Gardner, and a lot of guys that have gotten a lot of uh, like use later. But then there yeah. are like more minor characters, like characters that aren't around anymore, like Blue Beetle and um, uh, Doctor Light. 
Uh, yeah, female they're doing, yeah, yeah, yeah the Light. Japanese female Doctor Light and uh, Mister Miracle, who is uh, the Fourth World Gods, aren't in the New Fifty Two. So you yeah, know, they are. Are in they one, now? in Wonder Woman? Oh, okay, they, yeah. Uh, Azarello's been using them. Uh, I haven't been reading it, but I, they're on the covers. So <laughs> all right. There's also a character named uh, Juan Gina. <laughs> <laughs> I don't think that's. <laughs> oh, I got. I'm finding. I got to find it right now. It's. It's here. It's, I don't think that's how you uh, say that. Uh, no, no. I'm serious. <laughs> Yo, I want you to read all my books now. <laughs> I'm gonna. I'm gonna find it right now. Yeah. No. One. <laughs> I'm serious. W a n d j i n a. One China. <laughs> Come on. Right. Um but this, I mean, it's it's the kind of book that tells great stories. It never takes itself too seriously. It makes me laugh. These uh, this is a great creative team with uh, uh, Kevin McGuire, who was recently kicked off of the Giffen Dematteis book that DC is doing because they wanted to go grittier, with a darker, grittier, grittier, grittier look because yeah. that always works. Yeah. Um, and they're not doing anything like that already. No, no, yeah. totally. This is oh. going to be totally outside. They and they also the, discounted the, the last Justice or Legion of Superheroes run, saying, "Oh, that was a different Earth." Right. Just so we can do this new book. So, yeah, um, yeah uh, but I mean, it is it is cool because they are still the Justice League and they are still heroes and absolutely. They're doing heroic yeah, things there's, and there's saving heroic the day. Stuff going on, and Max Lord is in here, and yeah. they're setting up plot lines and 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 you know. There's their story going on here. This is not. It's 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 more like, uh, like if you want to think about like Beverly Hills Cop, right? There's mm. there's some good laughs going on there, but there is a definite story going on there, yeah. and uh, the story is good. Uh, and it's just another. This is a shining example of of a great comic book writing. Also, um, you should always think of Beverly Hills Cop. You should just always think time. of Beverly. I think Don't that's forget. just a good Never life forget. rule. But Never yeah, forget. so. That's that's kind of uh, it's like I said. I, I want to give hopeless savages. It comes highly recommended to me, and I want to give it a good pitch. So yeah, we'll bring it next week. Yeah, I'll bring it next week. But Justice League Preview. International is something. Um, if you currently read the New Fifty Two, even though I don't know why you would put up with our abuse if you do. Yeah, if you read the New Fifty Two, um, I'm pretty sure you don't listen to but, this. But <laughs> uh, if you do, or if you have picked it up, and you're like, what are these guys talking about? Go back, find this. The prints are still, the trades are still in print. I'm pretty sure. Uh, and the first four collect their run. Check it out and see what DC used to be capable of in the modern age, and uh, and then you'll understand our 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 fury uh, because this is great stuff and it allows you to create connect with the characters. But it also it's great. Like when do you ever get to to laugh at Batman? Right? Yeah. Like read this, you'll laugh at Batman. All right. What do you want to read, Jeff? Uh, Earth World. Like I would love to read Mutant Massacre and and uh, I, I Extreme X Men. Even though there's a part of me that's like, there's a bigger part of me that's like, I remember that. Just because it says Extreme spelled it's with an X, extreme. that's what that's what that's, keeps you away. Isn't no, it? no, that's what keeps me coming back. Oh, okay. Is the Extreme with an X? Um, uh, Toby, I was with Toby when he bought Earth World, and I just can't get around Goblin Knob. I'm sorry, <laughs> like I just can't. I need it. I need to read it. Yeah, everything about this story is hilarious. Yeah. All right, Eric, what do you want to read? Uh, Earth World does look like a lot of fun. I have to go with uh, New Frontier though, because. Darwin Cook is like a genius, and I think he's like criminally underrated. Oh, and okay. a lot of people right, haven't right. read this book, and it shocks me because this book to me is like in my top ten DC stories ever. Uh, yeah, I can't believe that I haven't recommended it before. It's be it's brilliant. And it's so well done. I think it's just because I never owned it, and so I don't look at it on my shelf ever. But yeah. I am incredibly, incredibly torn between Mutant Massacre and New Frontier. We've already read Mutant Massacre, right? Uh, not all of it. Oh, like, okay. like I read bits and pieces of it when it came out because, like, I was reading yeah, Power Pack cool. and some other random stuff. Did the library, buy but it? I've never sat down and read the whole thing. Yeah. Uh, can I? Can I pass? Can we come back to me? All right, Kate. What, you, what would you like to read? Earth World. Earth World. All right. What are you voting for, Chard? Oh, I get to vote. I'm going to vote for Earth World. All right, then I'm going to vote for Mutant Massacre, right. and we're going to read Earth World. All right. Damn. 
Close. Close as But all these books will be brought back and we will talk about them because New yeah. Frontier needs to be New Frontier about. and Mutant Massacre I both definitely want to talk about. Yeah, uh, they're really important uh, important books. Um, and we'll just keep bringing Darwin Cook stuff until we talk about him because he's phenomenal. He's done so much stuff. We could just do a Darwin Cook and, episode. And Justice well, I think League we could do a Darwin yeah, Cook. Yeah, like, we could do a creator. Giant size super special. So, and JLI sorry, would be a great really book read. for... It's a long run. Long uh, I'd probably oh, will do it. No, one. if you're going to vote for an X-Men book, I'd rather you voted for <laughs> the one you did. All right, so All right, thanks World. for listening, guys. So, yeah, um, if you don't want to track down a hard copy, just go to earthworld.com. Go to the first page and start reading i recommend you go find a hard copy though because it is beautiful well, and this, really is. this hard copy i got i actually got the, this hard cover which is oversized and the first two issues of book two uh-huh. and they were all priced for 40 bucks and i had a 40 percent off coupon so i got all three for 26 dollars yeah me and, me and toby both cleaned up because i got the absolutely i mean for all the things that dc does that i hate they release amazing omnibus editions, and I got uh, the absolute edition of Alan Moore's Top Ten, which includes all of Top Ten, plus the five <sighs> issue Smacks miniseries yeah, that, that we've I recommended love. before, which is excellent, and the 49ers one shot. And I got to use that 40% coupon on because. And this hardcover is priced $40 just by itself. Yeah. Like, yeah, back and it, looks, it looks totally worth it, too. Like, it's, oh, it's, oh, it's huge size. Yeah. It's just yeah. beautifully printed. So, yeah, really I'm is. so pleased with this purchase. Yeah. All right. Uh, so, Earth World for next week. Um, Read everything we recommended thanks because for you listening. have all the time in the world. But, yeah. yeah. <laughs> Thanks for listening. Like us on Facebook. Uh, write an iTunes review. Yeah, definitely write an iTunes review. We need Helps those. people oh, find yeah. the Check show. us out yeah. on theouthousers.com. And you can also, if you're not a fan of the new 52, which see I how always imagine. Uh, see how did something long something stupid. Been yeah. fucked up, which recently was the whole uh, Jim Lee saying, well, it's not our fault you're about the whole Harley Quinn naked in a bathtub about to commit suicide thing. Apparently that was just us that didn't get that that was not their bad and they're not awful at pr so mm. remember that God, dc is not that, awful yeah. at pr yeah that's what i was they're, talking about they're amazing. last week the fact that i was talking stupid. about last week when you were talking about harley i'm like i'm glad you don't know what's going on now because yeah, no, no, you would be melting a microphone seriously, right now. seriously between between them losing uh uh blackman and uh jh williams, 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 williams and then dan didio comes out and goes well creative teams on books change and it's like and they're uh, they, not even they going to get change. to finish their run. They fuck don't them. leave. <laughs> they don't say, fuck you, we're leaving. That's different. That's not changing. That's leaving. Yeah. All right. So, All right. So, yeah. Uh, but yeah, check out theouthousers.com. And, uh, and uh, we'll see you next time. Yeah, yeah. thanks for listening. Bye. Bye.